Hey everyone, Tony and John bringing you King's Talk, presented by Cap City Crown. It's been uh, it's been a week since we last talked to you, and the last time we left off, the Kings were on a six-game winning streak. Four games later, we are now on a current three-game losing streak. Um, John, what's uh, what what do we miss in this last week? I guess. Well, it was the the first real tough stretch of games going to the east coast three and three and four nights followed by you know a return home to face a very tough phoenix suns team and you know if you ask the players it seems like it shoot around before the suns game talking about the road trip um and then it shoot around on tuesday or after practice um, the guys seem like for the most part, they're pretty positive, um, about the fact that they were able to have this stretch early. I, I know Barnes and Keegan Murray in particular expressed that. And I think we were kind of saying similar things, but you could see that, you know, especially on the back to back in Atlanta and then in, in, you know, the fact that late in the game in Boston, uh, the Kings just couldn't answer as this championship contending team was just raining points down on them uh, unanswered. And you could see, you know, especially in those games and even in the Memphis game, because the Memphis game, the Kings looked like, you know, they won the, that game. They that That's what extended their win streak to seven before they went ahead and lost three straight. What They, they played pretty well in that game, but they, they kind of, let things kind of get away from them a little. It got a little close. Um, And it was, I think they had 20 turnovers in that game, 18, something in that range, which is, I think they had at least 18 in all three of the road trip games. And so they got away from doing a lot of things they've been doing well. Um, And there's just issues in the fact that when they were on this winning streak, they were, it may be credited to playing most of their games at home on their win streak, but um, they're closing out the game in the final few possessions. And you could not say that about any of these games, except of course, maybe Memphis, but even the, you know, the Phoenix game uh, just on Monday night, the late game, you know, they get the stop. Like they played great defense with about 35 seconds left. Wound the shot clock down, forced them into a three in the corner. It wasn't like, a, a terrible look for the Suns, but they missed. And who who comes down with the offensive rebound but Toy Craig? And I watched that replay a lot, and you want to be able to do the little things, quote-unquote. But, man, that was just long rebound. Kevin Herter came down to crash the boards with him. Toy Craig sandwiched in between Sabonis and Herter. Credit to Craig for coming down with that one. And, uh, you know, Herter made a good second effort to swipe at the ball. But, you know, give credit where credit's due. You want to get that rebound, of course, but I don't know. It just didn't seem like the, I guess what I'm saying is, I guess it didn't seem like they really, they, they really got gassed, I guess, on the road. They were very tired. They were a step behind. They were, were not making the best decisions, particularly in, in the back to back. And then in the fact that they just couldn't answer. So th- there was that. And then it just seems like they've kind of just gotten away from being able to close out games, which is particularly true in that Suns game. I don't know. It just seems like they got away from doing everything that they were doing in a way. Not everything, but a lot of it. And a lot of threes haven't been falling. I think that's important to note, too. Yeah. But, no, you're, you're totally right. Um, it was a, it was a tough stretch that, that three games – in four nights, all on the road, all against good teams. Um, it was it was nice they beat Memphis. Like you said, it kind of got close towards the end. But, man, it just it felt like that end of the game, Memphis, was just John Morant just running into people and just the refs calling a foul anytime he went into contact with someone. It's a little frustrating. Like, yeah, it was close, but I was like, what, what are you supposed to do in that situation? Like, Sponens had his hands up, and he's just, like, running into him. It's like... He's like foul. Like he sh- he shot what like six 
six nine six to nine free throws in that last like minute and a half or whatever. Um, yeah. It was. That, I mean, I don't. And then I, I don't. Three point shot. I just never really got that. I don't really get why the NBA would reward that. Because first of all, it's like I always thought this about James Harden when I was younger. I was like, why do they reward this guy? Like, just out there flailing a lot of the time. <laughs> that's how I see it. And I'm just like, that's not exciting. I'm like, I'm not saying I agree with this and this is how it should be. But it's like, these guys are trying to maximize money, you know? That's not how it should be, but that's the way it is. And so it's very odd that they just reward free throw shooters. And I think you were saying the same thing about Trey Young to me, Mm -hmm. you know, outside the podcast. And it's just like, yeah, I hadn't really noticed it's annoying, but. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Playing Young and Morant in back-to-back games was a little annoying to watch. They just both seem to play fouls a little more than actually, like you kind of said, the James Harden type of play. Um, it's not a fun way to watch it. It's a lot of like ticky tack fouls too. It's just like, yeah, like you're going to give that to them with the Morant, especially to end the game. It's like, that's yeah. just running through traffic and just getting a call. Cause he, he, cause he's just jumping into people at that point. Um, yeah, it, ugh, I didn't like that. The, and then like you beat them at least. Right. Then you go to the Hawks and you lose to the Hawks and there's, it's like, okay, like Fox kind of had a bad game. Um, it's like the second night of a back to back. He's probably tired or something. And then you play two nights later in Boston, the best team in the league. And you, you they kind of hung in there, but that first quarter was so bad. And even though they came back and took the lead later in that game in the third quarter, it was, you know, and then they, the Celtics just th- blew them away at the end of the third and in the fourth. But, um, like th- those were acceptable losses on my part, the Hawks and the uh, the Celtics. Yeah, but that came on Monday against the Suns. You come back home, a couple days rest. It was just, uh, it was frustrating. It was a little tougher to swallow for sure. I was hoping Fox could could get back on track, but man, he's just he's not looking too good these last three games. I don't know what's going on. Um, <laughs> right after he's saying that he can get to any spot he wants, right now. He's just now he's getting to those spots, but he's not hitting. So, mm, yeah, he needs to hit it's those a, mid-range. Yeah. Before we transition to Fox, mm-hmm. just on that Suns game, I you go down kind of the box score, and you're like, okay, obviously Monk and Sabonis had great games. Herder found a way to be impactful. Um, you know, Keegan Murray didn't have a great game, but. It was at least a little step in the right direction. It felt like they tried to get him involved early, which you saw that when they got Barn, uh, Harrison Barnes going earlier this season after a pretty poor start. They were very deliberate about getting him going. And it's been kind of the same thing with Keegan Murray off and on. And maybe that's more the game plan at home where he plays better. Um, but you kind of went down the line, and there were maybe like two guys in particular that did not performed very well and one was Barnes who you know I guess they're like sometimes you're bound you're bound to disappear so I'm not gonna like jump back because we just said last week that like Barnes is playing well like hell the Kings might be talking about giving him a contract extension all these <laughs> things I'm not gonna let I'm not gonna really let like the road trip and then like one bad game let's see what happens in this this Indiana game but um, the guy, you know, well, I guess this is the transition of Fox. I guess the guy to, 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 to point out that performed particularly poorly while Phoenix's star player, Devin Booker, was just going off oh, against some really nice defense. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, I know Katie Christensen was pointing out that, um, you know, he's using his arm and this and that. I'm just like, I don't know, man. Like, what? Yeah. that was just amazing to watch. Like, yeah, it was, incre- it was incredible. He had a hell of a night. And uh, as uh, Malik Monk said after the game, book's going to book, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, he did. And so given the fact that the Kings lost by such a close margin, it, it really amplifies the fact the real big negative coming away from that game is not the offensive rebound for the Suns at the end of the game. It's the fact that De'Aaron Fox had a bad game. And 
you know, like you said, like coming back home, you'd expect this team to have bounced back, especially taking on the challenge of playing one of the better, more proven teams in the Western Conference. Um, you'd think that that would be the case for the whole team. And for some guys, it kind of was. They played really well. I kind of mentioned them. But to just see Fox put together basically his third under uh, underwhelming performance in a row, that's just – that's kind of one of the biggest takeaways from that game. 100%. He, 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 needs to, he needed to play at a higher level that game. Like I said, like, we'll give him those past – those two games before – like second game of a back to back, and then the third night and four games against a really good Celtics team. It's like okay, like he's bound to have bad games. But you come back home, especially with Devin Booker, like you said, just having a fantastic game, and it was Fox's turn to step up on his side. He, he was just he couldn't. I don't know. He just he didn't even look like himself. They brought him in late, and he wasn't even bringing up the ball. It was Mitchell bringing up the ball, and Fox was standing in the corner. I'm like, what's going on here? So I don't know if something's off with him or what, but um, it was, yeah, it was definitely very noticeable. And he, you know, he has his normal game that he's been having or just hit a season average of 25 points. They won that game. I think he only right. scored 17 last night and uh, or two nights ago and they lost by five. So it was yeah, in, uh, these, in these last three games, he's averaging 16.3 points on 34.7% shooting from the field. Yeah. And that's, that's not he, he can't string. And it, if, this, if this dude's trying to be an all star this year, you can't string three games in a row like that and three straight losses, especially especially that Suns game. Because uh, everyone else played so well. Sabonis so had a good game. Monk had a good game. Herter had a good game. Yeah, Barnes, whatever. He didn't do so much. But um, ah, they win that game. And that's when he has to step up. It doesn't even. It didn't even seem like he was trying to step up, which was kind of frustrating too. He, like I said, he was kind of just in the corner towards. I mean, he wasn't in the corner the whole time, but he's he's got to you know put his put the foot to the metal and just go for it. Put the foot on the gas, but he just didn't. He didn't seem to have that same energy in that fourth quarter. Um, you know, the guy who I don't know if he's still leading the league in clutch points, but he was at one point. I think the last yeah. time we talked, but Fox got to step it up. We, I, I don't want to see four games in a row of him doing this, especially against the Pacers tonight. This is the game that he needs to, you know, you know, Halliburton is going to be coming out. He's gonna yeah. Be coming out hot. And he's not only is he going to be coming out hot tonight, he's already like burning hot right now. 48 assists in a, assists in a row without a turnover. It's oh, dude, dang. Yeah. <laughs> he's on, he's having a, <laughs> He's having a year. He's leading the league in assists, 19 points a game. Right. And, you know, and he's obviously still upset. So he's going to be coming in with a vengeance tonight. And Fox, yeah, I don't think Fox has that same uh, chip on his shoulder, I guess, as Taliburton will. Maybe Sabonis might be playing the Pacers. It's, not, it's more of like, I guess, Sabonis' game than Fox's because he has the tie to the Pacers. But uh, I hope yeah. Fox can come out strong and he needs to get back on track and he, he needs a 25 point game for sure i would put it this way i expect tyrese halliburton to have a good game i expect sabonis to have a really good game i um, expect buddy to have a good game too i was just about to say that he scored 25 points against this team when the kings visited late in march and the question is the one of the more key guys in this whole situation this whole trade the storyline is De'Aaron Fox. And so it's going to be very important just to underline what you're saying here. It's very important for him to show up, you know, and I don't know. I mean, what would, just in terms of like, what's up with him? Um, like what, when did the baby announcement, was that, was that Monday? Was that before the game Sunday or something? Um, I was, I was pretty sure it was before the game on Monday. It was between. It was over the weekend. It had to have been. It was. I'm pretty sure it was after the Celtics game, but before the game against um, Phoenix. So somewhere yeah. in there. I mean, I doubt it had that could pull his attention too much away. Just a baby announcement. Um, I I don't know how much if that had anything to do with 
<laughs> maybe it's just poor. That would only explain his poor performance on on Monday. But um, you know, James Ham was uh, post game on Monday asked both Mike Brown and Darren Fox kind of if you know anything along the lines of if the point guard was hurting or feeling any aches and aches or pains. I think was the terminology he used, and uh, you know, Mike Brown was kind of just like no, like. I don't know, like everybody's kind of suffering from aches and pains. Um, he knows he had a bad game. I know he had a bad game, and we both know that he's got to have a better game. And then Darren Fox basically said the same thing. So, you know, but it, when you when he asked Darren Fox, it's just like no player is going to tell you, like, yeah, I'm like beat up, like on the record. Like they're not, they're always going to be like, yeah, they're going to say the whole, everybody's feeling something kind of kind of thing. We're about 20 games into this thing. Um but it wasn't like the most convincing answer. I don't know. You could probably go back and look at it. I think Fox 40 has the clip post game. But maybe there's an injury. And this would be speculation on my part. I have no idea. But maybe he's hurt. Maybe there are some aches and pains. I don't know. Do you see anything? Uh, I don't see anything. Um, you know, <laughs> I don't see anything that would be bothering him. Um, I mean, some guy did comment on a post who is not a verified source in any search, in any way possible. He said, we're that, just throwing it out there. We're throwing it out there. <laughs> <laughs> that Fox, I don't know. Maybe, maybe someone else saw this name, but that Fox hurt his ankle in the Memphis game. Um, I don't know. Maybe I should reach out to him and ask him where he's getting this information from. But, um, I, I mean, I I don't see it. I don't, I don't see any ankle affecting him anyway. So I I wouldn't really trust that. Um, I, I you know what? Maybe maybe Fox is just having a bad bad stretch, and that's something he's done over the years. He he kind of barnes it sometimes, or Barnes goes on a bad stretch, and he'll kind of go on a bad stretch. And uh, I mean, it's not. I mean, I'm not saying it's like okay, but he he does it. Maybe it's just. That's the reason. Maybe it's as simple as that. But again, if he, you know, if he wants to be an all star, if the Kings want to do well, he's he's going to really have to limit these bad stretches to like three games max. They, they need that scoring so bad. Well, when the bonus is out of the game and Fo- it's just Fox and Fox isn't putting up points, I, like luckily Monk can kind of cover it a little. But <laughs> once the bonus is out of that game and it's Fox's team on the floor and he's not scoring buckets, they just suffer. So yeah. That, and it, like in clutch time too, that's that's when it's killer too. And Booker is just going back and forth, just n- knocking down shots, and exactly you know, Fox isn't anywhere to be seen. And you know the, the Kings don't have a lot of go-to scores. Like yeah, they have like the they have the I wouldn't even really call this a bonus a go-to score. Like maybe you can like Monk, I guess, and Herder. I don't even really call Herder one, but you need a bucket. You got to go to Fox, right? So he's not hitting, yeah. especially in a close game against Phoenix. That's just that's just detrimental, and it, it it showed on Monday night. Yeah, I think a lot of those guys that are not named De'Aaron Fox, a lot of them when they put up a lot of points, especially Monk and Herder, um, I feel like a lot of I mean Monk gets the rim a lot, and he was really good at that, and he had some great finishes. He was really feeling it um, against the Suns, but a lot of their scoring is like it, it comes through Sabonis, you know. Fox is unique in that he can just he can do that exact thing that you're talking about, like in those moments in the late third, early fourth quarter when Sabonis isn't on the floor, he can take over and maintain things um, without that passing big. Um, and he, we're talking about the fact that they lost some of these games, particularly the Suns game, I guess, in the last few possessions now granted it was kind of a twist of fate that they were really even i mean like in the last last seconds that like herder steel was crazy big <laughs> but totally unexpected but they really lost that game in the last few possessions and we we're talking about how on the win streak they're winning these games in the last few possessions fox is winning these games late in the game against the Cavs, against the lakers helping the team against the warriors um and now that's not happening and they're losing games. I don't think that's any coincidence. And 
he's just, I don't know. Maybe he has a great game against the Pacers, and this is the end of this slump. But I don't know. Um, I don't know what's up, but it's pretty imperative that he gets <laughs> gets things together because you're playing another good team with – added emotion to it undeniably so so i mean you gotta you gotta kind of step it up here um like we were saying you expect three guys that are kind of involved in this indiana sacramento trade thing um or that uh, you know that are related to it directly and fox is kind of that fourth guy i mean he wasn't involved in the trade but he's heavily connected to it um and what happened as a result so it's going to be huge for him to also have a big game. Yeah, when Fox struggles, the Kings are going to struggle. So hopefully he can have you know bounce back tonight. I would love to see the beam lit just so Tyrese can see it. Maybe that'd piss him off a little, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he needs to come back tonight. He needs to come back big. So I, I mean, I have fat, I have, I have fat, I have faith in him. Uh, it's he's a good player. It's uncharacteristic for him to have these games. So, you know, the odds are that he's going to score 25 rather than scoring 16 off a of 35% shooting. So let's hope let's hope it's tonight. Sooner than later, really, for this guy. And he knows it. He knows he needs to come out stronger. So it doesn't seem like there's anything that should be affecting him. So I guess it's just on him. Just a bad stretch. But this is the night. <laughs> this is the night to come back strong for sure. Yeah. Well, moving on to that Indiana game, let's, you want to preview it a little bit? I mean, there's kind of an added element here with the fact that Halliburton and Heald will be making their return to uh, Sacramento. And, you know, when these teams played in March, Sabonis could not uh, play. He had just hurt his knee um, in Phoenix and did not travel with the team to Indiana in March. So this is the first homecoming between any of these players or for any of these players. And so this is going to be huge. Uh, You know, do you expect Indiana, I mean, not Indiana, to the Sacramento fans to root for Halliburton? I mean, before you answer, I'll throw out there that um, they were asking Barnes about it after practice on Tuesday. And uh, he was like, he he would have he he said something along the lines of like he would have expected them to cheer no problem but i think he said in light of recent events maybe i don't know and then i think sean cunningham brought up a little later he's like maybe are you thinking of the marvin bagley situation of him getting booed a lot and uh not really that because that's a whole different thing um but he didn't expect bagley to get booed every time he touched the ball so he doesn't know what to expect. What do you expect when Halliburton gets called? When I when Halliburton gets called, the Kings fans are going to go crazy for him. They love Tyrese Halliburton. They love him, and they were you know nobody wanted him traded. Like I like I don't like I'm not saying like I'm I'm upset with the trade, but I love that guy. I was a little upset when he got traded, even though it was for the greater good, right? But he's he's a great young ball player. He has love for the city. Like, yeah, he's being a little dramatic as of late with the trade and everything. But, like, whatever. It just, you know, it kind of just it just shows that he really wanted to be here. Um, but, no, Kings fans love that guy. Um, they're going to go crazy for him. And it's going to kind of end there. They're not going to be rooting for him during the game. They're going to give him his standing ovation. And then he's going to play in the game. But they're not going to boo him when he gets the ball like Bagley. They'll yeah. just root against him like any other, you know, player. So that's my – I'm pretty certain with that. I, I don't see why you boo Halliburton. It's like he, he has never said anything bad about Sack, really. Just the organization for trading him. So Halliburton yeah. was a fan favorite here. People still really like Halliburton. Like <laughs> that, that trade – that trade has not, you know, it's still, there's still a lot of talk about it and a lot of people saying they still wish they had Halliburton. So, you know, I don't think those people are right, but there's still, there's still a lot of love for Halliburton in Sacramento. I bet there always will be. 
really. He he was traded so early in his career, and he showed so much promise, obviously, and he's continuing to show why he's going to be a really good player in this league. But, yeah, the, the Halliburton's going to get a big uh, applause once his name's announced by Scott Moak. So it'll be cool to see. I hope they show it on TV. But uh, what, do you, what, what do you think? you think I'm wrong? I think Buddy might get booze if that makes you. Well, we'll talk about we'll talk about Buddy, but um, (laughs) I think I think I think overwhelmingly it should be people cheering. I think there might be an element of people that maybe just won't cheer. I don't know. I mean, like maybe they're bothered by things. But you're exactly right. He never said anything about the fans. He said nothing but good things about the fans, and. Everything that he said about the organization, it's just his his opinion. And I mean, aside from when he said that they that he was part of a losing culture, I mean that was just undeniable. Uh, that's changing now, but uh, now that he's gone, but not because he's gone, but <laughs> incidentally, so I guess. Um, but you know, there's nothing nothing to hold against him, and I, I don't expect anybody to really. There's not going to be any animosity towards them um except in that competitive sense i guess like you said and for that whole kind of uh drama i guess that's been kind of stirred up uh, as of late i guess um i think we said this maybe a week or two ago but um maybe with halliburton coming in getting the innovation from the fans Seeing the Kings play well, maybe even win the game. I don't know. Knock on wood, Kings fans. Um, and, you know, like you said, all the other stuff, seeing the beam get lit, things like that. Like maybe that would change his perspective to kind of see it from kind of the perspective that I kind of think is the way it is, which is that both teams have benefited, that this made a lot of sense, that you're not some – freaking song that someone skipped or whatever you said um that's not the case at all it's, <laughs> it's just and in the realization that you as a person needs to take a step back and and f- realize the kind of numbing kind of reality of of business that that's just the way it is in the game and you just can't take offense to it so hopefully he can kind of gain that perspective and i think he should even if the kings lose i mean like you'll see the kings compete play well they have competed and they've been in every game that they've been losing um, for the most part, except late in that Boston game. Um, And, you know, it should, it should be, it should be, it should work itself out. And I think that, you know, the people that maybe in the national media that want to stir up the whole Halliburton Kings thing, um, I feel like they'll, they'll be, they, they won't be given much ammunition from this one. So it should be good. Right. Yeah. And and you know what? Like kind of something I've always thought about on this situation. I haven't really said anything is that if there's anywhere you'd want to be traded because you and but you really love Sacramento, it's like that'd be Indiana. Right. Like it's kind of like a smaller, you know, I mean, Indianapolis is a bigger city. Right. I don't know. I mean, I don't know how big it really is, but. You know, like I heard Indian Indiana fans are nothing but great fans themselves. They love their basketball. And it's probably helping out right now that they're the fourth seed in the, the East right now. So, he, and you know, that's probably helping him get over being traded from, you know, basketball hell. I mean, it's it's kind of turning around now. But I get he wanted to help. But he's now he has his own team. He's leading them well. They have their own great fans. And I'm surprised he's still not over it, kind of just based on those those things right there. But. You know, maybe he just he just feels hurt. He feels betrayed, I guess. But yeah, like like you were saying too, like just just, just the city. If he really loves the city this much, and the fans, and he's seen them happy, I guess, with the product without him, and hopefully he doesn't take it personally. But yeah, it will help him move on. He's like, oh, okay, like this was good for the both of us, right? So I I hope so. Um, but I, I can't imagine this being an issue. I mean, not, not even an issue, but like a storyline much longer. It's already yeah. played out as it is. Um, and, you know, it, it's going to come with maturity with the kid as well. And he's going to look back one day and it's like, 
God, that was dramatic. Like, I mean, just like one of those things you think of in the middle of the night where it's like, God, I remember when I posted that story about the Kings and how it was that song about <laughs> being skipped, but now everyone loves it. Like, he's going to he's gonna feel embarrassed about that, right? So he's young and he, like, I guess he just feels betrayed, really. It's like he got broken up with. No one likes being broken up with. So it, it it'll subside soon enough, but hopefully tonight's a, an eye opener for him and help him help him take that next step. But yeah, yeah. Well, what about uh, Buddy Heel? Do you think what do you think the ratio of fans cheering and booing him is? You know, I don't know honestly. I and I only say that because I don't know how many fans are in Sacramento or going to be in the arena that are like. Die hard, die hard fans, like I, I would consider myself, and who were like really just don't like Buddy for like all these reasons that I don't know if you see if you're a casual fan. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with being a casual fan, but I could see those people um, cheering for Buddy while the more, you know, fans are, are more in depth with the team. Um, I could see them booing them or booing him. So, I mean, I'm I'm trying to put myself uh like in the situation and think about it. I don't I don't know if I would boo buddy personally. I just feel like it'd be a little much. Um but I I feel like I would want to, you know, at the same time. I don't think <laughs> I would cheer for him. I'd be like, yeah, 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 buddy, good job. Like I don't like he never did anything that bad to us. It's not like, it's not like he mattered, right? Like we were so bad under him. It's like it's even worth our time to boo him. Like Bagley was a little different, like F Bagley, right? But Buddy, it's like he, you know, he was part of that Jaeger team. He was fun and everything, but he was under the Luke Walton years. And it's like, like I mean, like is even booing someone who was who played under Luke Walton and is coming back to sack. Like, is that even worth our time at this point? Like, who cares? So that's how I kind of feel about it. Yeah, I just feel like it'll be a really small ovation compared to what a Halliburton will get. And I think that'll just say it all <laughs> that a guy in yeah. a year and a half made far more of an impression on the fan base than a guy that was here for what, four years. <laughs> and he's going to hate that. <laughs> you know, yeah. That'll bother that. him. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So that'll be, that'll be that. That'll do it. I mean, there'll be some people booing. I think I don't know that there'll be really anybody booing for Halliburton, but I would expect he probably won't like hear it. It won't stand out, but there'd be people mm-hmm. um, just like you're saying that uh, kind of just uh, accounting for everything that healed kind of did for this team, especially late or didn't do for this team. Um, you know, I think uh, all that adds up and he was a little brat after the game in March, you know, just bringing up, man, I don't know how much he hated it in Sacramento. Oh, he just stand in a corner and all that stuff. Just out of nowhere, nobody asked. He just brought it up. <laughs> yeah. Well, after, you know, after after he lost the game for his team by dribbling it off his knee, so and, you know, I don't know, yeah, and he's he, you know, I don't blame him for not liking Sack. He's a guy who'd rather be in L.A. or some big market anyway, and he he has an ego to him. But I'm kind of thinking about it now, like yeah, like Buddy was he was really good under Jaeger. That one year um, before he got fired, before Jaeger got canned, right? He was he was shooting 43 from three, um, you know, on like three three makes a game, 20 points a game. You know, he had a really good year. And then he, then he, then you bring in Luke Walton, and Walton just, you know, leaves this guy on like the loosest leash for no reason either. It's like, yeah, this guy's a combo like, guard. Like, no, he's not. But now he's you now under like a good coach in Rick Carlisle, and he's played pretty well in Indiana. And so, I mean, it kind of makes me happy to see, but he's just not like a washed up guy and that he's kind of getting back on track. And I, I don't watch Indiana games. I don't know if like, I mean, I doubt Carlisle's playing him the same way that Luke Walton allowed him to play. But I mean, I don't know. It was kind of just unfortunate. Like, I mean, it's obviously Buddy's fault because that's not like, I don't know. It's just a guy you can't put on a long leash because he's going to milk that thing like every inch you give him. So, uh, I don't know. I, I, like, good for Buddy Heald, I guess. Like, I'm glad to see him succeed because he was one of my favorite players on the team at one point until 
like Luke Walton just kind of just let him do whatever he wanted. And like I said, that's not that it goes goes both ways for sure. But like that dude's, I don't know. You put him in the right the right you know system, I guess, in the right position. He's gonna he's gonna succeed, and he's having a good year this year. So I don't, yeah. I don't really say much. <laughs> just just, <a> just <laughs> uh, it'll be it'll be interesting. Um, just overall, I mean the the Pacers are. You know, like Halliburton, great distributor. It would be important to pressure them. Uh, it would be important to guard the perimeter. There's a lot of good three-point shooters on this team, um, including their two rookies, um, Mathurin and, and what, Nimbard. Uh, I think Nimbard hit a buzzer beater against the Lakers on Monday. So, you know, the, these guys these guys can shoot. Uh, it would be important to, just for the Kings to be the sharp, more sharper team. Uh, you know, don't turn it over. Get to the free throw line. Just stuff like that. Um, but Buddy healed. You know, I I I I, I hope. Uh, I think we said this last week. I hope Buddy healed can uh, give us another Buddy special, and we can uh, <laughs> just just like old times' sake, right? Yeah, just bask in the glory <laughs> of that. There's almost like a beautiful, like. Beautiful. There's something beautiful, like about that tragedy of Buddy Heald throughout the course of the game. Like in that game in March, you know, it's just like he had a nice game. Yeah. And then it just, to the sound of like Italian opera, it's just like he just <laughs> threw the game away. He kicked it away. Kicked it. I mean, that's you know something we had, we had to deal with many a nights in Sacramento when Buddy Heald was on the team and. <laughs> And, you know, I bet Indiana sees it a lot. You know, I, I don't know how many times he's made boneheaded plays. As like I said, I don't watch the Pacers, but I'm assuming he's had a couple where Indiana fans, he left them scratching their heads for sure. That's Buddy, it's Buddy Hilt for you. It's the full package, right? Comes with it. Yeah, that's the way it is. Um, But, you know, I guess we didn't really touch on this in terms of this three game losing streak, but uh, the defense has kind of been, uh, I mean, it's always been kind of subpar, you know, lower, you know, lower than where you'd like it to be. There's some good moments there, but kind of stands out now that you're losing games. Um, it, it Sometimes it, it seems like more than anything, it's just kind of, I think I think Harrison Barnes last week said that the biggest issue defensively is just kind of like gaining familiarity with the communication. And then Herder said something similar this week, like we just sometimes don't always have uh, the right amount of focus all the time. We just need more consistency with the focus and staying locked in, which staying in tune with each other. You know, it's just sticking with that you know, on the string kind of mentality. Um, but do you, do you, do you worry about it a lot or do you think that it is coming around? Um, do you have any particularly strong feelings about the defense? Um, it kind of just seems like it is what it is right now, but. Um, yeah. I mean, nothing. It's not good. <laughs> it's not terrible, but you know, it definitely needs to be better. I just to the, you know, with Mike Brown as your coach, you, you expect a little more. And it's still a little early, but I don't know. I, I don't have too big of a, I don't, I don't know. I just, it just seems like it's been about the same level all year. But I don't, I'm not like a big defensive strategist, so I, <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a lot to say on it. What, <laughs> Strate- strategist <laughs> strategist is that uh is that i don't know strategic i don't just never heard strategist that's interesting <laughs> yeah strategist strategist i don't know yeah, yeah. but <laughs> yeah what's uh i'm gonna just i'm just gonna throw that right back at you <laughs> well they're they're 25th and they're 25th in defensive rating and i think they were ranked a little higher than that um but like earlier, but like still just below middle of the pack. But 
you know, I, I'm not really worried because the fact that they're, you just see so many good moments where just everybody's just pulling it together. You saw it when they came out of the, the timeout with 35 seconds left against Phoenix. Granted, they did not complete the stop because the Suns got the offensive rebound. But everything up until that point was great. And that's proof that, you know, I mean, it, of course, it came off of a timeout. You darn well better be playing either whether you're on the offensive end or the defensive end. You better have a pretty good game plan. And, uh, and of course, Mike Brown kind of got them amped up probably to, to, to make – an attempt at getting that stop, but it's proof that, you know, this team's got it in them and you just kind of like, you work on that communication, you work on that ability to stay locked in for as, you know, as Mike Brown says, for as close to 48 minutes as you possibly can. And I just think that given all those elements, it's just like, and the history of Mike Brown defensively, particularly last year with the, with the Warriors, um, the way, you know, they progress defensively throughout the year and the way that younger guys that never really, because younger guys never really have to think about defense until they get into the NBA because they're always just better generally. And so to see guys take steps in the right direction um, under Mike Brown and produce one of the best defenses in recent memory, um, you know, you just got to believe. I don't think the Kings are going to get there, obviously, this year. But um, I think they can they can get back up towards the middle of the pack. And if anybody's going to be able to do it, it's Mike Brown. But, you know, it's one of those things where you just see it. Sometimes there's just like, what the heck's going on? Somebody missed something. Wide open shot. There's just too many, especially lately, I think over the last four games, there's been a lot of wide open lanes to the rim, a lot of wide open threes. Mm-hmm. And I just feel like, I don't know if that had to do with the traveling, maybe losing half a step on your, on, on some of the guys, but I don't know. But I just think that it can only go up, right? Because Mike Brown is, he's yeah. that guy. And these guys seem so willing to want to get there. Yeah, I mean, you, you would think it could only go up from here, right? Um, and they, I think they've shown improvement and they seem like they have a lot of guys that have been playing good defense. I think it's just, like you said, it's just missed assignments or, you know, leaving a guy wide open. Um, it seemed like a lot of easy paint points are still coming their way. Um, so something needs to be done about that, but you, you wrote a good article on Sabonis and how he's definitely not the problem on defense. Although it can, like, kind of looks like he is, um, I think you described it pretty well that he's not the problem. He's doing his part. I think the problems might be coming on the exterior, stopping their guys or leaving guys open on the perimeter for an easy open look or, you know, a drive to the basket. So maybe just, just start there. But if anyone's going to help out, it's going to be, uh, you know, it's going to be Mike Brown, a Mike Brown led team. And kind of something that was nice to see on, in the Phoenix game was when Terrence Davis made a mistake um, he, he was in the restricted zone against a DeAndre Ayton cut. And he just like immediately called timeout and he like pulled Davis like right to the spot. He's like, all right, come here. It's like, you're in the restricted zone. Like you, you can't be in the restricted zone. You're not going to get a charge that way. You need to be out here. And sure enough, like a couple minutes later, DeAndre Ayton, Ayton was cutting to the basket and Terrence Davis was standing outside the restricted zone and drew the charge. So, you know, it's just like, you know, that's kind of like a bigger picture of it, I guess, or a smaller picture. But, you know, he he definitely has the right, you know, he, he's the coach to do it, I guess. He has the right mindset. He's a good defensive guy. And, you know, he, he, everything's very so tech, or technical for him. So if anyone can do it, it's Mike Brown. And I think they, I think this team does have it in them. They have guys who can play good defense. So I think it will be, it'll come around eventually. I don't think they're going to be like a number one defense this year that good but yeah i mean in the middle of the pack i think they have i think they have the talent and definitely the coaching to do that yeah they could be a playoff team if they can get to that level because they have a top offense um but yeah in terms of that davis play i mean 
It's like, yeah, TD, just step up, man. You're giving him a wide open lane. You're not even defending him. You're going to stay in the restricted area. You can't do anything there. Um, and then what does he do later? He gets a charge like two minutes later in the game. Um, and that's the exact thing that I'm talking about. And, you know, they, they, they figure it out. And you, like Davis, like Monk, you're seeing these guys progress. Like Herter, like every time, like Herter had a beautiful uh, interception um, in the first quarter against the Suns. And he's just so smart on the weak side. And so they, they coached him up to be just very good in terms of that. And he's been a plus defender, I think, this year, as have a lot of guys. But I think just putting it all together is playing together. And uh, that communication and that staying focused and locked in for as close to 48 minutes as you can. I mean, I hate to be such an optimist but I, about something, but it's like, I don't know if you're going to be optimistic about it. If we were, it, this was the point when we talked about Mike Brown being the coach of this team, was that well he'll make the defense better. But that was the given. You know, everybody's like, "Well, is the offense going to be good?" I mean, given the personnel, of course the offense is going to be good. But, um, you know, I think in the long run, there's there's reason to I guess have some optimism. But kind of transitioning to what you mentioned with Sabonis. Um, so the Kings give up a lot of paint points. They have the least blocks per game by like a wide margin. I think like Keegan Murray leads the team in blocks at like 0.6 a game or something. Um, so a lot of people see the defensive issues and just say, oh, they need a rim protector. And maybe that's true. I'm not saying they're wrong, but I don't think Mike Brown thinks that. So when Brown in his last year with the Warriors, which was last season, as the unofficial uh, defensive coordinator, you know, uh, he was asked in February at a time when, you know, the Warriors are playing well. And, you know, I think it, we can be sympathetic to the fact that sometimes you got to reach for topics or critiques. <laughs> um, I mean, you don't see that with the Kings, really, um, not until maybe recently, but. For the Warriors, it was, you know, looking for something to critique about a really, really good team. And one of the things that they wanted to do with, like, I think Draymond was set to miss some time and James Wiseman's knee was still a problem. And basically the only big man on the team was Looney. And so people were saying they should add a big man uh, or a rim protector. And Mike Brown was asked about that. And in a San Francisco Chronicle piece was quoted as saying that you know, like we don't really need a, you know, shot blocker the way we play defense. It's just more about kind of like making shots difficult. You don't need so much vertical size to make a shot difficult. You can be six, six and contest a shot correctly or get in the way of a guy driving in the lane correctly and make things more difficult. And that's the kind of defense that, that they were playing is what he said. And when you think about that, why would it be any different for the Kings? Um, you know, you think about the only rim protector on the team is the guy that rides the end of the bench, and we kind of all expected that to be the case. Um, and it's just not really part of the game plan. And if you look at Sabonis, especially over the last few games, he's playing been playing some really good defense in terms of meeting guys at the rim, keeping his body straight up, and disrupting shots. There were a lot of times when Morant was trying to get, you know, we were talking about John ja, ja Morant's mo is getting to the line making himself look like a firework in the air and exploding and flailing all over the place to get to the line and sabonis sometimes fouled him but there were a lot of times there where he stayed straight up did not foul him did not get called for it played really excellent defense he met guys in transition he he does a good job of putting himself in the right position he's smart enough to do that and he's a good enough leader he's always talking always going to be talking he's I think when Mike Brown was with the Warriors, he described um, Looney and Draymond Green as being kind of the watchtowers in the back. And Sabonis is just that. And you see him playing great defense on a string. And a lot of these issues are not really coming from him so much, especially lately. Um, so, like, looking at the way Sabonis has been playing, 
um, he's kind of the the model for what um, for what Mike Brown wants in terms of a paint defender and an overall team defender. Um, Sabonis is not really athletically gifted, but he's smart enough. He's in it. He's uh, he wants to be part of the team defense. He wants to get those stops. He's he's willing um, to compete. I think Mike Brown said that defense is all about personal sacrifice and Sabonis is all that. And so that's the exact type of thing that they're looking for. And you can see it in other guys. You can see it in the way Monk plays defense, even Terrence Davis, Kevin Herter. I mean, these guys are figuring it out. So it's kind of incredible, you know, when you think about it, because I didn't expect myself to be coming to that conclusion, you know. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, yeah, <laughs> I don't have too much to add on to that. Like I said about the defense earlier, but um, yeah, I mean, so Sabonis, he, he seems like he's made a lot of strides, especially from the beginning of the season uh, while he, where he was fouling a lot and getting into foul trouble and stuff like that. You don't see that too often anymore. He is getting nice contests, just going straight up, meeting guys at the rim. And yeah, like he's not blocking a lot of shots and no one on the Kings is. But like you said, it, it doesn't mean, or I guess like Mike Brown said, it doesn't mean you can't have a good defense by, you know, by, by, uh, I don't know. I lost my train of thought. You can't, have, you don't need shot blockers to have a good defense. What I'm trying to say, like Brown yeah, and said. You, and, you, and you saw it with the Warriors because Kevon Looney and Draymond Green, those guys aren't shot blockers. And, um, <laughs> but it, it, one of the things that people keep, the thing that makes it interesting, I guess, is that a lot of people will look at, I think like the four or five block shots Keita had in a G league game. I think he also had like 38 points and like 18 rebounds. It was a big game, monster game against the Santa Cruz warriors. And everybody was like, well, why don't you bring him up? Um, and it's just like, well, first of all, that's kind of asking a lot of Keita. <laughs> um, and I think that they kind of want to keep developing him for another year down there at least. And it just doesn't fit with the game plan like we're saying here. You know? So it's just kind of important to keep that in mind. Now, I think Keita can figure it out. I mean, he, he's got some athleticism to him. If you watch his college tape, he did some – you know, defense coming out on the perimeter to guard guys, not like exceptional at it or anything, but you know, he's got some athleticism to him that makes it promising. And that's really what you'd probably more want to see. Um, the shot blocking element would just be icing on the cake, I think for Mike Brown. So to kind of lead with that is the reason for him to come up, uh, be brought up and be given the reserve five role, just kind of for whatever. I, I don't know. Um, or like sitting him on the bench and disrupting the ability to play consistently in the G League. I don't know. Um, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he can be the guy. Maybe at the end of the year, he's, you know, playing 15 minutes a game off the bench and averaging two blocks. I don't know. But um, I doubt that. And I just think that given everything Mike Brown likes um, and what he's getting out of Sabonis which is kind of a sign of what he could potentially get out of other guys. Um, I just think that Mike Brown's going to stay the course. And I think, like we were saying, there's reasons to be optimistic that this defense can figure it out. Just based on last year alone, obviously you're coming off of a great platform of great defense for a long time in Golden State. So he made a great defense, a super defense. Um, he's just trying to turn a, a, a bad defense you know, from last year into a, into a good one this year, but I think it can, it can, it can, tr you know, trend in that direction. Um, but mm -hmm. I don't think Nemus, I don't think Nemus Kata is going to be part of that. Um, no, I don't think Nemus Kata is the answer. Um, he just, he's just a little too slow still. It's kind of still a raw product on top of that as well. You think you would try Alex Lynn, uh, before you try Nemus Kata. So, um, you know, you hope Kato one day. He's he's a good shot blocker. He's a big guy, big presence. And he, he was known for defense uh, at Utah, Utah State, Utah. 
Mm -hmm. Utah State. Utah, Utah State. State, yeah. So he was known for being a you know a good a good defender at Utah State. So hopefully he can, he can develop, but he needs to develop first, and he's only going to be doing that in the G League. So he should stay there for the time being. I you know Kings fans love getting high on their rookies and overrating them, and like Kate is the next guy, or why isn't he getting a chance? And because he's a raw product still, he's he wouldn't fit this offense very well. He's still slow. He would get burned on switches just like Len was getting burned. So you know for all those reasons, really, but doesn't mean he can't one day. I just don't think he's here yet. Yeah, and like on a note too about Kate, it's just when the report came out like a week ago that the Kings aren't exploring any trades for Barnes. They just want to work with the chemistry they have. While Kata, you know, has gone through camp with these guys and would have chemistry with these guys, there's no continuity of playing together. And that's definitely true for Kata. There's no continuity of playing in the NBA. There's, he's had very sparse minutes in the NBA. And he he didn't look particularly comfortable. I mean, why would you <laughs> in those first few minutes? So, I don't know. Maybe he could change that. Maybe something is different within and I'm sure he'll get an opportunity sometime this year to play. But I don't know. I wouldn't really be counting on him. Um no, I should but no. No. But not um yet. not yet. I really do think that you could I mean, he's got a lot of promise, like I said, mm. athletically speaking, defensively speaking. And some of it, and his offense has really come along. I was really impressed with the strides he's made offensively, no doubt. But mm-hmm. it's still like, still sometimes he's not the most controlled in the post. He has some beautiful moves sometimes, but it's, it's, it's hit or miss still at moments. And uh, he still kind of struggles to finish with his offhand. But, you know, kind of talking about young guys. Uh, Keegan Murray has been struggling a little bit. Um, I think we alluded to it earlier that he has been playing. I mean, he, he played maybe a tad bit better coming back home, which was kind of expected as he plays better as a gold one center than in other stadiums on the road. Um, but he's still kind of got that kind of rookie slump right now. Um, but do you think he's, he's primed for a good game? I mean, do you think with this whole Indiana thing coming up and there's a lot of uh, emotion, a lot of guys that played with Halliburton, some guys that were involved in that trade, uh, involved in that game, uh, former players of former teams. Uh, <laughs> I, would, I, I don't want to be negative, but I almost feel like that could be – could, that could contribute to maybe the game kind of getting a little over his head in this one. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it helps him lock in or something, but I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on Keegan Murray's play of late and maybe what he can do against Indiana? Yeah. I mean, with every, like a lot of people having stakes in this game, like some bonus Halliburton healed and Fox, um, I don't think it's Murray's game to break out. Like you said, maybe it'll be a little overwhelming. I'm not sure. I just know Murray hasn't really looked the same. And you know what's funny about Murray is that he's, ever since we drafted him, especially in Summer League in his first like five, six games, maybe not even that many games, but he he looked like, he kind of looked how when, like when Tyrese Halliburton came into the league and he's like, dang, this guy looks like he's been in the league for eight years. That's how Keegan Murray looked through summer league, preseason, first few games in his career. But he's really starting to look like a rookie. And that's what I kind of don't like about Murray. It's like sometimes the missed shots aren't so much. We had a couple plays in the Phoenix game that I can remember specifically where he had this one dribble where he like he had this dribble move and he pulled up and his foot slipped, but he shot it anyway. Yeah, I was lay just it. Yeah, I was gonna mention that one. That was yeah, so like, out of control. Yeah, it's like just don't don't shoot that. It, it, that looks like a rookie making that player, and I think he had a. Well, remember, like, rem- remember earlier in the game in the first quarter, he had a traveling violation because he was gonna put up a shot and didn't put it up. It was another. Yes, down. yeah, it's another one. Mm-hmm. So he probably didn't want to do that again. So he just forced the shot up. It just seemed like he he, he made a mistake 
didn't learn the lesson of avoiding a bad shot and and then made a double whammy, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then he had another play where he like <laughs> stuffed himself against the backboard or the rim and then it was a jump ball. It's like, I, I don't know. It was just like, it's just a lot of plays and he just, he, he's looking like a rookie now. And that's just something that's disappointing me a little because he just looks so matured like this whole time until the last, I guess, I think it's been the last month now. I think that Hornets game was on Halloween. And that's when um, his his grandma had that accident. But, or not that accident, but that, you know, that tragedy. And so, uh, I don't know. He's, he kind of just came back down to earth and he's kind of been back down to earth since then. I just, at least looking like a rookie will. So I kind of want to see him making smart decisions again. Um, and, you know, I think that can take him a long way. He did look a little better against Phoenix than he had in, you know, recent games. But I don't know if this is the one where he's back to hitting like three threes and scoring 18 points against, you know, a game that's going to have a lot of emotion. Yeah. I mean, one of the things like looking kind of big picture um, at his struggles, it obviously the th- the inability to hit the three in, in 12 games in November, he's shooting 27.8% from three. And when that's not falling, that was really what, I mean, the composure of course was always an element and maybe he's kind of slipped away from that. There's been some moments though, where he, you know, is really good on the offensive glass or where he was aggressive in transition at one point against the Suns. It's not all bad, but I do very valid points on your end. But it's just interesting that when that three's not falling, it's kind of, well, how else do you impact the game? And it almost feels like he's forcing it at that point. And it's weird because in college, he was a really good low post player and the three-point shot was developed later. I think that's how that went. I know there are some Hawkeye faithful out there. I would love to be corrected. You guys know your basketball. Um, But... I think that's how it went, and they don't really use him that way. And I think Brendan Nun- Brendan Nunez asked him that uh, after practice on Tuesday, like, you know, you were a really good post player in college. You got, I think he, I think he said he had not, like ninety seven percent of his points in 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 the in the in the paint area. I'm not one hundred percent sure on that. I didn't double check, but. You know, it could be one of those things where he's still trying to adjust to figure out maybe what his game is in the NBA. Um, And, I mean, he he, one of the things that made him really good, also, if I'm not mistaken, was his cutting ability and whatnot and ability to get inside um, off the ball. Um, So it's kind of a wonder that that's not kind of a bigger part of what's going on for him. But... I don't know. It just kind of seems like he's kind of been forced to play maybe a different way. And that's just kind of a part of that adjustment period. And I think that he will adjust and the three will start falling again. And that'll really help open up other things for him. Um, But it's just interesting. It kind of, kind of almost seems like his, it's just like, as with almost a lot of players in the NBA these days, it's just your game really starts with the, are you hitting the three or not? Um, And it's not crazy that a rookie's shooting 28% from three in a month, and that happens. Uh, it happens to rookies all the time. Um, but there have been some moments that have been kind of uh, surprising in a negative sense, uh, like here and there, as you were kind of pointing to. But I think if he just kind of sticks with it, guys kind of remain confident in him, which it seems they are, he should be able to pull it together. I mean, I don't think anybody's worrying here, not on this podcast, um, about Keegan Murray at this point. But it is, it, it, I think my conclusion there is it really it starts and ends with the three for him right now, at least at this point in his career. Yeah, I, and that, that's good analysis. I think once that starts falling, Everything else will too. Like I, because nothing really looks good of his. Honestly, I think he's just. I it, yeah. I mean, he, like at the beginning of the season and in preseason and 
summer league and all that before the slump. He was like, he had a really nice floater. Um, you know, I, he just had a lot more confidence in just all, all levels of his game. But now it's like that three's not falling and it just seems like everything went with it. So, yeah. And it was nice seeing him. I think he got to the line a couple times last night. And um, I think they were saying just, you know, I think they, they, this is a classic Kings scene or maybe it's just NBA scene, but I heard a lot in the Kings announcers. They're just like, yeah, just sometimes you just need to see a couple fall in and you'll get back on track. And yeah, I think that's that was, all he needs. I think that was Atlanta. I think he had four free throw attempts. Atlanta. Okay. It, yeah. It was on the last few games. So I mean, he, he made his lone three against Phoenix. I, I forget how he did against Boston. I, I think it was pretty bad. <laughs> yeah, Boston, he was one of six from three, but he did have a career high in rebounds at 10. He had 10 rebounds in that game. No, well, that's something to hang your hat on, I guess. Yeah. But um, yeah, it, it's all going to start with the three for Murray. And that you made a good point. I didn't know that Murray, you know, kind of was a paint scorer, like a post scorer in college. So because he kind of just came to the Kings and it's like, all right, he's, a, he's our stretch for now. So, you know, that is a big adjustment. And maybe he just started off really hot, and now he's kind of cooled down. I mean, he's he started off really, really hot, like over those summer league preseasons and to start off the year. But you know, he had he had that family, uh, you know, that family thing happen, and you know, it brought him back down to earth a little. And and you know, I hope he's doing okay and all that. So hopefully he can hopefully he can get back on track. Just start knocking the three down. He he knows, and you know, his dad's been pretty open about everything and he'll he'll say what's wrong with his son you know and i think he'll be i think they'll be the first to tell us what's going on and it's probably that three shooting that three-point shooting maybe just a lack of confidence too you know some of those three balls don't fall you kind of get a little nervous when the ball gets in your hands and you have a long shot ahead of you so we'll see it might be a little bit of confidence thing he definitely seems like he's lacked some confidence uh recently as well that's what happens when you don't play well right but that's a rookie for you. Yeah. I uh, just honestly, I maybe just walking away and seeing a hundred, hundred percent conversion rate from three against the Suns, one for one. Um, maybe that's like watching a free throw go in. Maybe that'll yeah. change it up a little bit. I mean, he'll figure it out. I mean, he's made steady progressions in his three point shot throughout the years from his freshman year to his sophomore year. Um, I expect it to kind of come back to what we expect uh, here. Once his comfort level kind of comes back. Mm-hmm. but And it will. He, he's yeah. a good player. But, man, well, it's been a rough November. It has. It has. Just uh, it, it, it's not, not what you want to see. But, uh, you know, on a similar note, um, whereas Keegan Murray – kind of kind of went inside out in his development and put it all together in his sophomore year. Um, everybody seems to be watching Chris Murray, his brother at Iowa in his junior year, do the same thing or a similar thing. Um, and he had been playing pretty well there for a second, got Iowa in the top 25, 25th ranked team. Um, they're lost to TCU in the Emerald Coast Classic final, uh, basically knocked them out of that uh, 25th rank. But he'd put together a stretch of some really good games uh, there for a second. A uh, 22-point performance, a 29-11 and 11 rebound performance, and a 30-point game, um, followed by a couple of underwhelming performances of 10 and 11 points, respectively. Although I did catch the i watched the omaha game that he put scored 30 in um omaha can't really guard anybody they scored 64 they lost 100 to 64 um clemson definitely collapsed on murray Murray's the reason that iowa team was in the top 25 you take out murray you you don't really have much of a threat so it's going to be interesting to see how chris murray kind of moves on from that um the better shooter of the two brothers um, but he's, I think, currently ranked somewhere in the middle of the first round in terms of like pre-draft rankings. I guess you know, 
Uh, I'll probably regret this later talking about it in November. Um, but, you know, Murray is projected middle of the first round, and some people expect the Kings to be somewhere in that that range. This is the first season that Chris and Keegan have not played together. Um, I'm sure they'd like to to play together again uh, next season. Uh, <laughs> any thoughts on that potential? Potentiality, I guess. <laughs> Um, I mean, it'd be nice, right? It'd probably only help both of them, I would assume. I mean, it'd be kind of like bringing in Malik Monk for De'Aaron Fox. Like, oh, it's like my buddy. But this would be like your identical twin brother. Um, You know, it'd only be good for both of them. And it'd be awesome to get a talent like Chris Murray. So, you know, like maybe the Kings will fall in a position where they can draft him. Sounds like you know, a guy that can help the team as a, a big man shooter. Those are guys are pretty coveted around the league nowadays. It is very early, so it is hard to say, you know, where the Kings will be, where Chris Murray will be, what the Kings' needs are, I guess, when we get to the draft. But, hey, I'm all open to it. Yeah, it would be it'd be great. He's a great shooter. Um, so far in six games, he's averaging 19.3 points. On 38.2% from three uh, with nine rebounds and 1.2 assists. Uh, he kind of like, I mean, it's his twin. He's not far off. They're not that different of players. I mean, people point out that, you know, Chris is the better shooter. And Keegan's probably better on the inside. Or that's definitely how it started. Um, but Chris Murray would be... I mean, that would be a great story, wouldn't it? Just to be able to have them together. And I think you raise a good point just to kind of add that comfort level. I mean, that would be immensely important for Chris Murray. I think coming into the league and just being able to join under your brother's wing to uh, kind of adjust to the to the NBA, that would that'd be huge. It's kind of more of a, a nice idea at this point um, more than anything else. There's not really any legitimate reason to believe that this is imminent but um yeah i don't know keegan murray if you like keegan murray you're probably gonna like chris murray so um eh, that would just be cool and you'd be getting a good player um so yeah you'd be getting a good player and you'd be getting like a good kid right like the keegan murray has only shown us and especially his dad his dad seems like a very high character guy as well and it, it, you know, it emanates in in uh, in Keegan. So I am assuming Chris is the same way. Humble kid, just oh, um, you didn't, oh, you didn't hear, you didn't hear that Chris is the evil twin brother. Oh, yeah, okay, never mind. No got diabolical don't. plots. Monte, yeah. stay away. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's gonna steal the Declaration of Independence. Um, yeah. that's what you yeah. get for spelling Chris with a K. As a, as a, but he's a man. I don't know. Okay. That <laughs> I'm, a, was, I'm a big, that's, a, that's an odd critique, but <laughs> I mean, CH, you know, you're a guy. It's in my opinion. Man, they, man, Kenyon, I'm Keegan, going and there. Chris, they're all going, they, 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 they're going with the, uh, oh man, they're going with the, the K's. K's. It's like and, the Kardashians. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly like the Kardashians. But you're going you to Chris Jenner with a K. I mean, now he's Chris with the K. Is this spelled know. the same way? Yes. K R I S. Oh, wow. Well, that is that is that is right. at least something to note. I think um, so. Right, that's how write that, write I am. that. Write that. No, write that down they don't draft him. There. He's his name's Chris with the K. That's it. <laughs> trade trade the pick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. But um, yeah, Chris Murray. What a guy. What were you saying? What a guy. No, I think uh, that pretty much is. That's pretty much. I'm not a uh, an Iowa Hawkeyes expert. Uh, I would hope somebody would let us know uh, about Chris Murray. What are we missing here? He yeah, seems like you, a good player. That's all I know. But um, the seems two like games really that I watched, yeah. I, I mean, no, he's he's a good player. Um, he's definitely gonna. And he seems like a first round pick. So Iowa fans, just let us know in the comments, like. What you think about this guy? How, how you think on how how do you fit on the Kings? So I'm definitely interested. I know there's enough of you out there with Keegan coming to the Kings. So 
Glad yeah, to have you in sack. What's similar about him and his brother, and what's different? And that's what I want to know. Mm-hmm. A little more, a little more in depth. I get the general idea, but yeah. And what's funny too is that they're both left-handed, but Keegan plays basketball right-handed, but Chris plays left. Right. So that's kind of funny. Right. Yeah, but yeah. And then I guess that would make either. Keegan yeah. the evil twin, right? He's I like, yes. Maybe Keegan. I imagine Keegan's the evil twin is like how nice he is. He's like, and doesn't show any emotion. And Chris <laughs> is just like this nicest guy. Like, yeah, nice really, really personable. And you're just like, man, maybe Keegan's a psychopath. <laughs> yes, exactly. But yeah, I mean, Keegan shows no emotion. Just like out there. Looking, so you got a turnover. You just like look. <laughs> right. It's a three. It's a three. Just looking. <laughs> He's just looking, dude. But <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, yeah, maybe Key. I don't know. I, I, I'm. I think Keegan's the evil twin now. I, I, I say that about there. Well, hands. we'll have to get. We'll have to get to the bottom of this. Yeah, we'll have to learn. You Iowa fans, you did comment now. Who's evil? <laughs> who's the evil twin? Yes. Yeah, and who's the good one? But yeah, but uh, I think we're dragging this on uh, too long. Um, what else do we got, or or is that it? Huh, I think that's kind of it for today. Um, I think uh, the only note would be you guys should check out uh, the shop. Get yourself a Beam Team T-shirt. Yeah, uh, Beam Team. We we uh, also partnered or- up with Keegan. Yeah, yeah, the Keegan Murray Christmas sweater. Keegan check it out. Murray Christmas. Murray Christmas. Yeah, check it out. Um, on the store, capcitycrown.store. Exactly. Go get yourself one. A Beam Team sweaters are selling out pretty good, so get it while they last for sure. It, and if they do draft Chris Murray, imagine. Yeah. I don't even have to know, change the design. It's, it's going to be like a – it's going to be adding the next ho after ho. So it would be a ho ho or something. I don't know. Dude, I mean, I, even if you don't like Keegan and you just hate, you despise Keegan Murray and you like Chris Murray, they look the same. Like it's That's just true. a picture of there's just a picture of a Murray brother up there. You can just say it's Chris. I don't know. I Murray, mean, there's no nothing related with the Kings on it. So, or or Murray one and Murray two. That's <laughs> Murray, yeah, I like that. I was I was thinking maybe try to do like a like a shining like sisters, you know, thing. We're out on a Halloween sweater. I don't know. We'll get there if Chris Murray is drafted by the Kings, I guess. But come on, Monty McNair, hook it up. Yeah, come on. We we have ideas out here for merchandise. But um, yes, check check out the shop for sure. A lot of good stuff on there. But to wrap it up, <laughs> the Kings play the Pacers tonight in a highly anticipated game where Tyrese Halliburton comes back to the Golden One Center. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun, a lot of emotion. I bet. Um, and, and you know, the Kings need to break this three-game losing streak, and it'd be uh, it'd be a good way to start right now against not only the Pacers with Tyrese Halliburton, but a good team. The Pacers are in the fourth seed in the East, so let's get back on track against a good team. John, that's the, you said it best. All right. Well, if that's it, then I guess we'll sign off here. And I've, and as always, thanks for tuning in, and have a good one.